For over a century, the legendary tales that have surrounded our great British airfields have inspired generations of people, including me. Which is why I am on a personal mission to cross the UK to visit some of our most important airfields. To understand not just about their contribution to our past, but importantly, how many of them have helped define our future. From the UK's first flight, through to groundbreaking innovations such as carbon fibre and the jet engine, and the extraordinary effort spent on preserving our aviation heritage. Join me as I explore the story of the airfields that have helped shape Britain and the world. I'm here in Farnborough, the birthplace of British aviation. And it's said that no other single location in the world has contributed quite as much to the evolution of aeronautical science as this place over such a long period of time. The aviation development in Britain and was the site of the Royal Aircraft Establishment, the military science research facility. During the 20th century, the testing of observation balloons and airships by the army quickly developed into groundbreaking experiments. It remains world famous for its air show and specialist aviation knowledge. Today, the Farnborough Air Science Trust, known as FAST, are the guardians of Farnborough's engineering legacy. How important was the RAE and Farnborough in the history of global aviation? Oh, enormously, enormously important. I mean, it brought science and technology into aviation, which was quite a young uh, sport in those early days. But effectively, you had a large number of departments that did aerodynamic structures, engines, materials. We tend to associate the evolution of the aircraft with the First World War. But even before the outbreak of the war, RAE here was up and running in a very far-sighted way. Farnborough was always looking 15 years ahead to, to actually develop new systems right through to the Cold War. If a new aircraft had to be built, we, the air staff came to us and would say, what technology do we have in 15 years' time? Because it'll take that long to build the aeroplane. So for over a century, RAE really has been a global centre of excellence. Oh, absolutely. But what happens to the RAE? It started to close down in the 1990s when government no longer wished to fund, centrally fund, aviation research. But there was 100 years of research here, it was all secret, nobody knew very little that went on. So we started collecting all the artefacts and the records from the libraries. The RE had a superb historical library which went back to 1898. Uh, we collected all that so now we're keeping a legacy in the museum and making it available for the public. Well, I've just touched the surface, so let's continue our yes, tour, Graham. <laughs> the museum's collection is enormous, holding over half a million items. It includes machinery, photographs, films and books, all relating to its illustrious history. Wow! Just remind me how many of these containers you've got again? We've got 18 44 containers and two 24 containers, full of artefacts. A Concord engine there. That's and a Concord then, engine. That's, that's a Concord, that's a 593. What's that through there? That's with, there's two helicopters through there. There's, there's a Lynx <laughs> and a Scout, a Navy Scout. You're choking. That's, that's yeah. the design of the atom bomb itself. But it's not just the paperwork and mechanical parts that have been kept. Their collection of flying clothing has more than 250 items of protective gear. This helmet is clearly in advance of the Second World War version. Yes, really, this is late 60s, early 70s, where Americans had loaned us some suits when we were looking at manned space program for Great Britain. And these were some of the very early space suits when we had a program to put man into space. One thing that strikes me, Graham, being surrounded by all of these artefacts, is the millions of pounds and dollars that went into developing each and every one of them. And yet now, you could say, well, they're sort of worthless, but at the same time, priceless in the story of aviation. Yeah, absolutely. You have to understand the past to appreciate what's going to happen in the future. 
Farnborough's role was obviously vital in the development of aeronautical engineering in this country, but it took an American cowboy to get the British aviation industry as a whole off the ground, quite literally. In 1896, the Wild West came to Britain in the form of Samuel Cody. But it wasn't just cowboys and Indians that captivated this American showman. His interesting kite started as a hobby. He found that flying kites drew a crowd. Therefore, he persisted in flying bigger kites. He developed a system whereby pilot kites would carry a wire into the sky, and that wire would act as an aerial railway for the anchoring of a man-carrying element which would go up and down the wire at will. Cody believed his man-lifting kites could be used for military observation purposes as an alternative to balloons. These, unlike kites, couldn't be deployed in strong winds. But he also perceived they could have an engine in, and the first motorised kite that he built wasn't big enough to carry a passenger, but it flew tethered, uh, but it demonstrated that, that with power you could get airborne from the ground without having to use a string and a wind. In 1906, the army was convinced, and Cody was made head of the design and manufacture of kites at the balloon factory at Farnborough. But he had grander plans, and he began work on his first aeroplane. Cody understood it had to be fairly lightweight, but if you're flying on cloth as a kite, with a single layer of cloth supporting you, the wing loading, the, the pounds per square inch that you can develop is quite low. So to get enough lift to build a big mass, you need a big aeroplane. And Cody understood that, and his aeroplanes were always big. On the 16th of October 1908, Cody made history at Farnborough. His British Army aeroplane number one left the ground and flew 1,390 feet at a speed of 25 to 30 miles an hour. The flight only lasted 27 seconds, but it was the first powered flight in Britain. Over the next two years, Cody continued to improve his designs, and in 1910, he made the longest flight in England, a record four hours and 47 minutes. But unfortunately, it wasn't to last, and on the 7th of August, 1913, tragedy struck at Farnborough. Cody was flying over what's now the airfield with a passenger when something on the aircraft broke. Whatever that was, it caused such a violent maneuver by the aircraft that the passenger and the pilot both fell out of the airplane. The 7th of August, 1913, was the day Cody died, not in an airplane, but having fallen out of one. No seatbelt, no parachute. Cody was a showman, a cowboy by trade, and a real man of the people. He received a full military funeral. But with the outbreak of World War I, just a year after his death, he was virtually all but forgotten. By 1916, the workforce here at Farmer had expanded to nearly 4,000, and they were working around the clock, desperately trying to make up for lost time. Ian, nice to see you. And you, good morning. Where better place to talk about the development of early aircraft than here in your workshop? Pleasure to have you here. Now, you've got a lovely example here uh, of what was going on at the time to try and create workable airframes and workable surfaces on aircraft. I mean, for those early pilots, being up in the sky, surrounded by nothing more than timber and linen, must have been terrifying. Well, yes, I, it looks very flimsy. It's a uh, bit of cloth, bit of wood. But once it's put together, once it's been treated, um, then it becomes quite a stable and strong environment. But this is the technology of the Victorian era. It certainly is, which is why so many cabinet makers went into aircraft production in World War I. But it just highlights how difficult and how dangerous these early days of aircraft development were. Exactly. But also in the manufacture, that um, one of the things that's done to the fabric is what we call doping. Doping being uh, laying this painting on this substance which stretches the fabric and makes it weatherproof. And it gives it that kind of drum-like... Exactly. But it also, when you're doing it, gives off a lot of vapour. And at the beginning, that wasn't recognised. And so quite a few ladies and men died as a consequence of inhaling that vapour. 
The rate of aviation development from 1908 to 1914 was staggering. By the start of World War I, there were just 40 aircraft in the UK, but by the end of the war, there were more than 20,000. The initial requirement was for aircraft that would be able to fly over enemy lines and observe what was going on. But then, of course, when you have aircraft that are flying over to observe, the enemy decide they've got aircraft that will shoot you down. So you have to evolve another type of aircraft, which is an offensive aircraft that can defend your observation aircraft. And that's the birth of the fighter. Exactly, exactly. And that, in a way, gives Farnborough its purpose for the rest of its life. It certainly does. The aircraft industry was established and Farnborough was then dedicated to pure research um, and development and test. During World War I, Farnborough had built over 500 aircraft and repaired thousands more. And by 1919, with the conflict over, the emphasis for the Royal Aircraft Establishment was now on science and research. The interwar years saw development continue at an incredible rate. While Britain was suffering in the Great Depression, the RAE were undertaking important developmental work on drones, missiles. They even managed to successfully launch an aircraft from a Royal Navy destroyer by catapult. The engineers and scientists were putting Farnborough on the global map. Farnborough's development at the beginning of the 20th century had been slow and steady, but World War I had forced them into a rapid expansion. British aviation had to improve and develop to become as good, if not better, than the competition. And with World War II just around the corner, the Royal Aircraft Establishment had to be at its best. Well, by the beginning of the war, in 1939, Farnborough once again was coming into its own. But if I'd have had the chance to wander around the airfield and throw open any of the hangar doors, who knows what I would have seen under investigation. But this once confidential report might give me a few clues. It's an historical summary of the Royal Aircraft Establishment between 1918 and 1948. But if we just flick through to the beginning of the war, to 1939 to 1940, well, the headings here really do tell you all that you need to know. The aerodynamic department were looking at low-speed wind tunnel testing. The instrument and photographic department were investigating the development of the gyro gun sight. The mechanical test department, well, they were looking at the business of self-sealing fuel tanks. But this is absolutely fascinating. In 1940, the experimental flying department received the first Messerschmitt Me 109 fighter to be captured and brought it here for rigorous trials. And it was flown by one flying officer J.E. Peabody. But I'm sure he could never have imagined himself that so soon after the start of the war, he'd find himself flying an enemy fighter, learning crucial lessons that he could feed back to the squadrons on the front line. It's fascinating to see the amount of detailed research that was being carried out, much of which at the time would have been secret. Even with the war raging around them, they were trying to improve pressure injection in engines and the effects of G-force on pilots. When you look at the breadth of endeavour and inquiry that was going on here, no surprise that some of the nation's best scientists and engineers were recruited to come here to Farnborough to carry on this vital war work. One of those bright minds was engineer John Charnley. He was recruited by the RAE straight from university in 1943. I was appointed to the flight test division of aerodynamics department. Although I knew nothing about it, that was where I was being posted. And this chap that had been sent to collect me took me into the hangar, and behind the screens was our first jet-propelled aeroplane. I became something of um, an expert on the jet-propelled aeroplane in its early experimental form. One of the pioneers tasked with testing aircraft was Captain Eric Winkle Brown of the Royal Navy. He flew a staggering 487 different types of aircraft. It's a record that is unlikely ever to be broken. Farnborough, frankly, in the war years was like a pressure pot because naturally the enemies was improving the performance of their aircraft all the time. And we all had to try and keep a jump ahead of them, if possible. But the Germans were very advanced in their performance aircraft, and uh, so it was quite, quite a difficult struggle. 
With World War II raging, there was no time to waste. In 1944, test flights from Farnborough totaled over 8,000 hours, an average of 23 hours a day. The test was to take a Spitfire, climb to 40,000 feet, put the nose down and tell him that the speed would increase and on the way down, he'd find he'd lose control. But don't worry about it. By the time you get down to 15,000 feet, it'll be back again and all will be well. And he believed me. In some aeroplanes, they lost control. In others, the stick got so hard that you couldn't move the stick. So there's nothing you do about it. You sat there and couldn't pull out until you got down to the lower heights. The characteristics would get back to normal. But it wasn't just British planes that were being tested. Farnborough's hangars were also filled with countless German aircraft, including the famous Messerschmitt ME-109. We had quite a few aircraft during the war years land in Britain uh, because they were damaged, shot down and whatnot. And uh, provided they were repairable, we did so, uh, and uh, then flew them to see how good they were. I find German aircraft were very logical in some of their aspects in the cockpit. For example, they used electrics a lot more than we did. And also they had color coded all things in the cockpit. For example, all the instruments that were associated with oil were a brown color. Anything associated with oxygen was blue. And so they went on color coding all around. So I subtly enjoyed and had a very high regard for German aircraft at that time. Being a test pilot was a hazardous occupation. And sadly, during World War II, nine pilots lost their lives at Farnborough. Flying at up to 700 miles an hour wasn't a job for the faint-hearted. Well, the thing we were trying to do um, was to make sure that our pilots, our, our aircraft, were better controlled for operational purposes, fighting, than the enemy. And in that case, you wanted them to make sure they were going as fast as they could, and also that they could be controlled in, in um, combat. The rate of testing was extremely high. I have in my logbook, I think, some five occasions where I flew eight different types of aircraft in one day. That is really pushing it. Because of this situation, this may have accounted for a number of the fatalities we had, because unless you really prepare yourself for this, you are going to get into trouble. I'm only five feet seven. I've saved myself two or three times by seeing the crash coming and curling up in the cockpit. Maybe I was overzealous in preparation, but it paid off. I'm here still. Thanks to the pioneering work of the likes of Captain Brown and Sir Charnley, flying has become much safer. Their work has informed subsequent generations of aerospace engineers, helping them to design and build much safer planes. And of course, with the advent of modern technology, many of those riskier tests can now be undertaken from the safety of modern simulators, which means that I get to have a go from the safety of the ground. Alan. Jules. Very nice Good to, to meet see you. you. Good to meet you. Now, flying is in your blood. You've got many thousands of hours flying mm -hmm. behind you. A few, yes, yes. And you've taught many others to fly, of course. Indeed. Yes. When we see on the news the launch of a new airliner, I'm thinking in particular of the latest huge <laughs> aircraft that's now out there from Boeing, just how risky is it for the test pilots taking something like that up? It's not as risky as it was. The lessons that were learned the science of aeronautics has improved uh, and our knowledge has, has improved. So before an aircraft even flies nowadays, the, the, the computer modeling that, that, that is used with, again, it's hand in hand with computer technology, shows that the machine is going to fly and it probably will achieve the targets that was set out from the drawing board. That said, they still don't fully know, hence they've got to get airborne and try it out and see. So there's still risks involved. But those risks are hugely mitigated nowadays, absolutely. In this modern age of commercial air travel, do you think many of us have lost sight 
of those early test pilots and just what they achieved? Yes, because we have these shiny, beautiful, safe vehicles, our airliners. And we just get into them and off we go on holiday. And what's gone into that science? Yes, absolutely. These are heroes, remember? Every schoolboy in, in the United Kingdom would know who the latest test pilot was. Well, today you're going to give me a chance mm -hmm. to fly next to you, Alan. Show me the ropes, seeing what kind of a pilot I might make in one of your very beautiful looking simulators. Yes, absolutely. I'll be delighted to show you what the thing can do. <laughs> he says with a smile on his face. Do you have you... a sick bag? <laughs> well, you know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> Come on, let's go have a look. Very good. The pioneers of aviation during the 20th century took untold risks. At Farnborough alone, nine test pilots died in the name of science. I'm certainly not brave enough to follow in a test pilot's footsteps. So with the use of modern technology, I'm going to fly a Boeing 747 simulator, which is used in the training of pilots today. I have no idea quite what I'm letting myself in for. Hey, Jules, uh, this is my colleague, Paul. Hi, Paul, nice to Hi, see Jules. you. Hi, Jules, nice to meet you. I can't believe I'm sat in the pilot seat of a jumbo jet. This is a boyhood dream come true. Thankfully, I'm not risking my life or indeed theirs, but I have got a lot to learn. Paul, are we ready to go? We're ready to go. Right then, let's go. Have control column here. Yep. That's to descend. That's to climb. Left and right. Very small positive corrections. It's very, very sensitive. As we go down the runway, um, I'll tell you to rotate. When you do rotate, just slowly pull back. Try and put the centre of the screen, that little square dot in the middle, yep. into the magenta cross. Should we give it a go? Now set in takeoff thrust. This is just astonishing. I've always wanted to see this. And rotate slowly back. And we're in the air. We're in the air. Gear up. Gear up. Bring the, the nose right up into the cross. Take some of the pressure off you and set the autopilot. Take your hands off the control column. So now we're flying. Now we're flying. The aircraft is flying itself. Now, at the moment, everything's calm and organised and everybody's back there enjoying their flight, I hope, getting into the movies and the drinks and so on. Yes. What could possibly go wrong? Should we have a look? Shall we? He's looking. What's your fancy, Alan? <laughs> well, I get to play God. And what we're going to simulate is a failure of one of the autoflight systems where you, as the pilot, are going to rescue the day. Well, with, with some help. <laughs> <laughs> so if I disconnect the auto throttle, yep. close the thrust levers, or just let the autopilot do its thing. So we've got our first warning, which is auto throttle disconnect. You can see the caution light comes on. So the aircraft is losing power. It is losing power now. We're only at idle thrust. The thrust levers are closed. Yep. And what's happening now is the aircraft is putting the nose up, trying to increase the lift from the wings. So it's doing that. So it's doing that. Yep. And as you can see here, on the artificial horizon, in fact, the nose is slowly coming up. And we're going into the yellow area here, which is the buffer warning, which is a warning of an oncoming stall. There's our second warning, yep. which is the airspeed low warning now. Now Ooh. you can feel the stall coming on. It's starting to shake. shake. Starting yep. to shake. Yep. And then the final bit that we have is the stick shaker, which comes in, and from that we recover. So push oh. the nose forward. Well, that gets your attention. Whoa! Wow. OK. Yeah. Bring the thrust in. Increasing speed, bringing the lift back into the wings. Keep heading down. Keep heading down. And then slowly, slowly, but not too fast, because you'll put it back into a stall. So you're pushing it back through you're the curve, aren't you? Yeah, you're pushing it back in to create the lift. Yeah. And we've lost a thousand feet in that action just to just to recover the aircraft and bring it back into a flying state. We level off at around about seven thousand feet. Yeah. And the aircraft's flying again. We have successfully got ourselves airborne. We've overcome the challenge of what could have been a very catastrophic in-flight scenario. Should we go and land? Yes. I can't wait on. to see that runway open up. <laughs> you have control. Clear land, 27 left, Jules, 01. We are coming into land at Heathrow, and I'm seeing what is a very familiar airport to me in a completely different light. 400 feet. Here we go, there's the terminal buildings, there's the runway, nice to lift up. Now look out the window, look down the end of the runway. Yep. Don't let the end of the runway sink or rise, just keep it where it is in the window. Yep. And you'll line perfectly. 100. 100 feet. Yep. 50 feet, 50. the thrust starts to come 40. off. 30. Okay. 30. Close the thrust levers. 
touches the runway, speed brakes, and we're down. Deployed, and we're down. Still flying though, still doing 140 knots. Slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. And I have control. Well, captains, both of you, thank you very much indeed, Paul. Thank you. Alan, thank you. You're very welcome. And it's nice to know that we're all that bit safer thanks to the work that you do and these remarkable simulators. Indeed. As well as testing the limits of aircraft at Farnborough, they were also interested in testing the stamina and the endurance of the pilots, if you like, the human factor. In 1945, the Institute of Aviation Medicine, known as IAM, moved in. The IAM's role was twofold. Firstly, to investigate the effects of the various stresses encountered in aviation on pilots, and secondly, to assist the Royal Aircraft Establishment in developing new items of aircrew equipment uh, to protect pilots against those stresses. The IAM pushed the human body to its limits. From G-force, the stress of heat and cold, noise and vibration, to spatial disorientation and human error, every possible scenario was tested. And when they ran out of volunteers and pilots, the scientists found themselves in the firing line. The scientists at Farnborough used themselves as experimental subjects. And two of the most famous uh, regard um, Roland Winfield and the Snatch experiments, which were designed to pick reagents up from the ground without having to land an aircraft. So the Snatch had to be clean, and then they had to be wound up into an aircraft safely without losing them off the end of the rope. The other famous one at Farnborough involved Edgar Pask, who was an anaesthetist, and this involved making himself unconscious and being thrown into a swimming pool wearing different types of life preserver to test which were most effective. You couldn't be a good human physiologist unless you regarded your body and those of your colleagues as something to be used and if necessary used up was absolutely true. The IAM became a world-leading centre for aviation medicine research. In 1994, the government combined their resources and the centre moved, forming the new Defence Evaluation and Research Agency of Human Sciences. Today, it's based at RAF Henlow, but the testing hasn't stopped. The business of aviation medicine hasn't really changed much over the years because the same hazards still exist in the flight environment. So pilots still need to understand about the, the dangers of hypoxia or low oxygen levels. When one gets hypoxic, there is uh, less oxygen being delivered to the body's organs. And uh, when one does get hypoxic, uh, brain function tends to diminish. Traditionally what we do is give people their hypoxia experience in a hyperbaric chamber such as this one. Uh, what we would do is sit them in here and simulate taking them to altitude by sucking out uh, some of the air that's in here. We now moved away from this type of uh, training and we do far more uh, ground-based hypoxia training. In that situation uh, we keep the pressure the same and it's the percentage of oxygen in the air that we decrease. Pilots uh, will be flying a flight simulator and doing flight-related tasks, whereas non-pilots will be doing uh, simple cognitive tasks, such as sums. These things uh, bring out the symptoms of uh, hypoxia, such as tingling of the fingers around the mouth, and some people even experience uh, changes in mood and uh, get, develop a euphoria. So if we can give our pilots and our air crews the training that they understand what some of the symptoms are, whether it be of hypoxia or spatial disorientation or things that they should do if they're in high G performing aircraft, then it's, it's really all about delivering that training so they can prevent getting into adverse situations in the air and therefore reduce the risk to their life. The work undertaken by the Institute of Aviation Medicine meant the human factor wouldn't limit any technical advances in aircraft design. Pilots today can take their aircraft to incredible heights at incredible speeds while performing death-defying manoeuvres. But throughout aviation history, some of these advances came at a high price. One aircraft that found itself grounded after only two years of service 
was the de Havilland Comet. It looked to take the world by storm until two unexplained mid-air disasters rocked the aviation industry. The first flight of the de Havilland Comet in 1952 in passenger service was a huge step forward for the passengers. It halved the journey times to the Far East and to South Africa. It allowed the passengers to travel in a pressurised cabin for the first time that was comfortable, that allowed them to fly at high altitude above the turbulence, and it really made a step forward for passengers. A year after entering service, problems started to appear. Two fatal crashes during routine flights grounded the entire fleet, and Farnborough scientists were called in to investigate. One of the pieces of work that Farnborough did was to take a fuselage just like this one and to put it into a water tank. By putting it into a water tank and pressurising the water inside the cabin, it simulated the pressurisation of the cabin as it would go through a normal flight. By doing that, they could do a flight in 10 to 15 minutes and really accelerate the wear on the cabin that it would see in normal service. And sometime in June 1954, the aircraft that was being tested broke and when they drained the water out and investigated the fuselage, they found out that there was a big crack growing from the forward port escape hatch. The constant pressurisation and depressurisation of the plane's fuselage during flights had forced little defects in the skin to grow and expand, which over time produced large gaping holes. This is a typical piece of comet skin. It shows how thick it was, just under a millimetre thick around the windows, and it shows the rivet holes have been punched in. And it's from these rivet holes that little defects grew, and just like you can see here, the constant flexing of the fuselage with pressurisation and depressurisation caused cracks to grow. And it's these cracks that grew and grew during each flight until the aircraft crashed. The de Havilland Comet became a successful design, flying for 60 years with the military as the Nimrod. And the lessons learnt at Farnborough meant that windows changed in their design, that the skins of aircraft became thicker, and we designed with fatigue in mind. This put Farnborough at the forefront of aviation research and also meant that air travel was much safer than it was before. The legacy of air crash investigations lives on in Farnborough today. The modern air accident investigation teams are based on the outskirts of the modern airfield. Every year their teams are called in to research air crashes, not least the loss of flight MH17 that was lost over the Ukraine in July 2014. So the name Farnborough hasn't just become synonymous with flight, but crucially with flight safety. The Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough's contribution to the development of world aviation is endless. No other aeronautical site in Britain has had such an unbroken record of involvement in research. The RAE Materials Department had joined the race to find the holy grail of material sciences, how best to combine the strength of metal with the lightness of plastic. And in 1963, three RAE scientists came up with the answer. Peter, carbon fibre has come an awfully long way since the early 1960s. It has indeed, yeah, indeed. What is it now that makes it so different to what it was then? Uh, it's, it's our knowledge of it and how to use it and how to process it. It's moved out of, if you like, the laboratory into everyday use because we understand it. The NCC is about accelerating innovation, taking it from the laboratory and, and really helping industry work out how to use these materials, how to manufacture them, how to make them safe and take advantage of them, if you like, all at the same time. What makes it so applicable to aviation? It's fundamentally the, the, the strength to weight ratio. You get the same strength in a very, very light piece of structure. The lighter you make the aircraft, the more passengers you can carry, the less fuel you use, all those sort of things that make aviation more and more efficient. And, and it is a phenomenal material. If you look at this here, the strength to weight, you can feel how light that is, but you just feel how, how incredibly stiff and strong that is. How important a discovery was this? Incredibly. Modern aviation just would not be the same without it. There's no way we would be flying aircraft the distance we are, with the economics we do, with the emissions that have been achieved nowadays. And of course now it's creeping into everyday life, particularly in sport, from boats to bicycles to bats. What are you doing with it now? What are we doing? Well, let me just show you some of the advanced technology that's being developed for the future. <laughs> 
Okay, so now I'd like you to show you the real cutting edge of what we do with carbon fiber. Here we're using robots to lay up carbon uh, into, into molds and make products. I'd like to introduce you to Ben from GKN. Ben? Hello, Ben. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Nice how are you? Nice to meet you. Wow, this is um, quite impressive. Which part of an aircraft is this? Um, so this is actually a winglet skin, uh, which is a lower skin of a, a winglet component, which sits on the end of an aircraft wing. And what does it do for the aircraft? Well, this, this effectively makes the wing appear like it's longer to the aerodynamics. It unwinds the airflow, makes the aircraft more efficient, uses less fuel, less CO2 emissions, but without uh, occupying any more space. So when it comes to moving the airport, aircraft around the airport, it doesn't occupy bigger space, they don't need bigger gates and all that sort of thing. So you're getting more efficiency without the, without the impact of the airfield. How much is aviation taking on carbon fibre? How much of an aircraft can be made from carbon fibre? Well, today about just over 50% of the current breed of aircraft are, are made out of carbon fibre. That's progressively grown from the early applications in the, in the 70s, which were just small parts. And as we've become better at understanding how to use the material, how to make some of the, the super critical parts, like the wings and, and, and other parts, have the confidence in using the material, then, then that's progressively found its way across the aircraft. And I suppose, Ben, when we come back to that issue of weight, so yes. critical to aviation. It's super critical, yes. How much weight does this add to a standard aircraft wing? Um, as we know, carbon fibre itself is a, a very light material for the strength properties it gives you. Um, you could probably imagine something this size, what it would weigh and how heavy it would be if it was made from aluminium, for example. So I don't know if you would just want to grab it and you'll see how, exactly how light this is. I'm not going to break it, am I? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so there you go. That's incredible. Yeah. That's lighter than a surfboard, isn't it? It is indeed. indeed. That's ridiculous. But like I say, when you consider how strong it needs to be, it's quite incredible the weight we can actually get it down to, to still perform as it should do on the aircraft. Ben, what exactly are these robots doing? Um, so these robots are actually laying down individual toes of carbon fibre. They go into different orientations, and this is what gives us the strength of the component by just different directions and different layers of this material. The reason we use this material is because it's very strong in tension. So if you wanted to pull on the end of that, we never break it, we both fall over and look it's, silly. It's not a Christmas cracker, is it? It's not quite. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. I hope, I hope it doesn't go bang anyway. Um, when you look at it in the crossways direction... You can tease it apart really easily. It's actually very fragile, which is why we need the different layers of orientation to get the strengths we desire. Well, it's been a fascinating opportunity to see behind the scenes and to see modern manufacturing, as you mm -hmm. say, at its absolute best. And certainly next time I go on holiday, I shall look again at the winglets out of the window. Okay. And I'll think of you, Ben. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> the groundbreaking work carried out by the scientists at Farnborough in developing the strength of carbon fibre allows designers to juggle the demands of aerodynamics, fuel savings and engine noise. In today's world of mass commercial flight, making planes bigger and faster is essential. The NCC is a fascinating facility. This is just one of the ovens they use to finalise the process of turning carbon fibre into aircraft components. But when you think about the 50 years or so that have passed since this material was first invented, trying to keep up with the huge advances in aviation technology can feel like quite a daunting task. But I think one thing is for sure, carbon fibre is here to stay. Until, of course, they come up with something even lighter and even stronger. One of the key tools in aviation testing is the wind tunnel. This massive 24-foot tunnel was built in the 1930s and could simulate winds of over 100 miles an hour, allowing scientists to analyse and improve the aerodynamics of aircraft. And with the development of the jet engine, a whole new spectrum of speed was unlocked – supersonic flight. When the British and French aviation industries combined to develop a new supersonic passenger airliner in the 1950s and 60s, where else would they come but Farnborough to test their design? Sadly, I was never lucky enough to take a trip on a Concorde. These days, all of those that did fly have now been grounded, and without exception, they're all preserved in museums throughout the world. To take a closer look at what makes this aircraft so special, I've come up to the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, and this aircraft is particularly unique because this was one of the first. The supersonic passenger airliner first flew in 1969 and entered service in 1976. British Airways and Air France built 20 Concords in all, with 14 making the transatlantic trip from Europe to America. 
I think part of the beauty of Concorde is in its perceived simplicity, but do not be fooled. On a conventional aircraft wing, for example, there are up to 50 moving parts. On Concorde, there are only six. There they are, either side of those two enormous Olympus engines. When you get up close to Concorde, you realise that with very few exceptions, there isn't really a straight line on it but it's the wing and this leading edge of the wing that really tells the story. It's a complicated series of mathematical equations that have created curve upon curve. In particular, this twist and droop running right down there to the wingtip. What it means is that Concorde had incredible stability at low speeds, but low enough drag to go supersonic. It is an essay in airflow. But to be honest, to really understand it, you need a physics degree. Just when you think you've mastered the simplicity of Concorde, you come into the cockpit and you realise that you've learned absolutely nothing. It is a maze of dials and buttons, and I suppose it really goes to the heart of the development of this aircraft. Well, it does. I mean, this was a pre-production model. Uh, there were two prototypes, and then there were two pre-production models which were used for testing. This was the British pre-production model. And am I right in saying that this was the fastest Concorde that ever flew? Yes, it was. This one flew at 2.23 Mach. 2.23 max, so in pounds and pence, that's 1,450 1, miles an hour. Isn't that astonishing? That's absolutely astonishing. I mean, that's virtually London to New York in two hours. Two and a half, certainly, <laughs> but, but yes. I mean, you certainly would have arrived in New York two or three hours before you'd taken off at Heathrow. That's incredible, isn't it? But in many ways, David, Concorde challenged and broke many of the accepted parameters for the operation of aircraft. Well, it did. It was very experimental in many ways. Um, obviously, there had been supersonic fighter jets and things like that that went before, but transferring that technology to an airliner that could carry 100 people with great reliability was a whole different ballgame. But it was operating in extremes of cold and heat. Indeed it was. It would take off from Heathrow on a cold winter's day in negative temperatures, and by the time it was flying at 60,000 feet at 1,400 miles an hour, it was probably 120, 130 degrees centigrade. So the fuselage expanded, uh, and expanded by round about nine, nine inches in all the units. Nine inches, so almost, what, 25 centimetres? Absolutely. I suppose one of the most um, headline-grabbing features of Concorde, apart from its incredible speed, was the nose, and the fact that the nose would move. Why was that such an important thing to create? Well, uh, basically because the wing is designed for supersonic flight, as the plane slows down to come into land, it has to take up a fairly steep angle, which we're all very familiar with. It flared hugely, didn't it, as it landed? Absolutely right. Yeah. Well, of course, the pilots couldn't see anything. I mean, they were, you know, they were facing the sky. So the droop nose was the, the solution. This particular aircraft, interestingly enough, uh, because it was the first time that they ha we had this uh, visor that you could see out of, uh, the visor lowers first, then the nose goes down to five degrees, and then ours goes down to 17 and a half. When they then started to get the commercial airline pilots involved and they started to fly it and test it out, they said, well, we, we can't see where we're going. Like the bonnet of a car, they had nothing at the front to look at when they were trying to land. I mean, I sort of take the point, um, there isn't a huge area of view there, is there? There's not a lot of a view, but all that falls away, of course, when you're coming into land. But they hadn't got this front of the bonnet, so they decided that rather than 17 and a half degrees, 12 and a half would be better. You know, this aircraft in particular, to me, is something of an old friend. It's one of the very first aircraft I ever saw here at Duxford as a young kid of about seven years old. Mm. And here I am still coming back to enjoy it. Glad to hear it. The Concorde bug has bitten. Yes, David, absolutely. thank you very much. Pleasure. After the tragic crash in Paris in 2000 and dwindling passenger numbers, the Concorde fleet was retired in 2003, ending commercial supersonic flight. But failures in planes don't stop development. They just make engineers and scientists more determined to succeed. And who knows how aviation will develop in the future. The history of Farnborough will be forever linked with the history of British aviation, but there can be few other airfields that have had such a long-lasting or indeed global impact on the story of international aerospace engineering. The RAE and all the other research institutions that were once based here have now long gone and Farnborough is now simply an airport.
but thanks to history and preservation, the stories and the lives that surrounded those early pioneers of flight will never be forgotten.